All right, everyone, welcome to the Hardly Out of It podcast. My name's Desi, and I'm the a content developer and podcast host for this one. Uh, this is a series where I interview people and just check in and see how they got to where they are in their cyber career um, and just to understand a little bit more about them. So if you're interested in learning more, jump to my website, hardlyadequate.com. But for today, I've got my old work colleague and friend, Julian, joining us. Um, thanks, Julian. Thanks for taking away some of your time um, to join us on the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Desi, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Cool. So always jump into the first question is, what does a normal day look like for you at work? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm currently a principal detection engineer at a industrial uh, cons- uh, industrial control system security company called Dragos. Um, it's a US-based company, uh, but I, I'm based out of Australia. So most of my work is remote. Um, I work in a little office, uh, my cave, that I really see the sunlight. Uh, so <laughs> so it's good for me. I like it. Uh, but I guess my, my day is kind of uh, split between um, a couple of different things. Uh, we, we work with a large detection catalog. Um, so some of my work is just kind of maintaining and um, fixing and cleaning that catalog to make sure that it's uh, working correctly for our customers and we're getting the best uh, value out of uh, what we're providing them. Um, also looking into things like looking at what, what's going on out there in, in terms of intelligence, looking at what's uh, threat activities happening um, and what's changing out there and making sure that we have the appropriate mechanisms to detect uh, TTPs that's uh, being used the most most frequently. Um, and then from there, probably looking at things like uh, support. So I have a lot of uh, contacts in the company that keep reaching out to me and asking me to look at weird things such as network traffic captures, logs. Um, just weird stuff, so I pretty much get a yeah. lot of strange things dropped on my table um, that I have to jump onto. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's pretty much a day. Yeah, I, I remember like the strange things is funny because you've been at the company for quite a while now, and I think you were the first Australian hire, right? Or you'd yeah. Yeah. kind of been hired semi overseas and then had come to Australia, kind of thing. So yeah, um, we we've grown pretty pretty big since I joined. So I think uh, mm. I think we're about 20 or over 20 people in Australia now, but I was, I was actually the first person outside of North America um, to join the company. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just coming on almost six years, I think in uh, next year, early next year. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely true. Like I know at the company I'm currently at, it's the people that have been in there the longest where it's like, where do I even go to look at this kind of problem? Because there's yeah, just so much you've got a lot of knowledge sitting there with that person. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You've got a lot of uh, knowledge that's been built over the years, and, and you know how things have shaped into where they are mm. today, uh, including yeah. all the problems and how you got there. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. So let's go back a little bit to what the job you had before getting into what you consider being in a cyber role, I guess. Yeah, sure. So I, I guess before I joined, I was still in a kind of technical position. Um, it's quite a short position, but I was working as a uh, on-site support technician at a at a private hospital in, in Perth. Um, it's oh, quite right. quite an interesting job, uh, kind of rolling out uh, new systems uh, throughout the hospital. Uh, so working with mm-hmm. uh, like rolling out IT equipment, uh, but also. Um, just doing kind of technical support for uh, nurses and doctors while they were, they were doing their job, um, which okay. ended up doing some kind of funny things like getting uh, live support when people are kind of being operated on on the table. So they used to have to get kind of scrubbed ah. up and go into the operating theaters to try and figure out what was going on with uh, computers and, and things like barcode scanners not working. Um, it's some, quite some funny uh, examples of things that <laughs> happen with that. So a lot of the times we'd find that um, basically, when you go into an operating theater, uh, everything that's being used, all the uh, operating equipment uh, is kind of barcoded and, and itemized so you can uh, track where they are so they don't get left inside somebody when they get stitched back up. <laughs> um, but what we'd find is a lot of the time the, the equipment wouldn't work. So we'd go out onto the operating theater and find that the nurses had swapped the, the scanners. So they'd be scanning the items from the other side of the room um, versus the machine they're looking at. Um, so uh, silly little things like that, but you know other things like um, putting those scanners through the sanitization equipment. Um, so you can imagine yeah. at the end of an um, a operation, uh, you've got to clean all your equipment. So that generally involves putting all the, the things like uh, your knives and stuff into a uh, like a, a steam boiler that really kind of mm. just smashes everything in there to kill um, all the uh, bacteria and stuff like that. But obviously, you can imagine that a barcode scanner, like a plastic device, doesn't really hold up very well in that. Uh, so mm. a couple of things like that we have to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. I, know, I hadn't really thought about the uh, 
all the electronics in the room. Because, yeah, I know, like, normally you chuck it in an autoclave for all the stainless steel stuff or, or whatever they're, they're using. Yeah, all the extra stuff that sits in the room. Yeah. Did you see, like, I guess approaches. some of the big machines, they're often covered in, like, a plastic or something as well, so those can be changed out. But then, yeah, the stuff like the scanners that j would just be exposed. So, yeah, and I, I guess you kind of needed to have, like, your phases, right? You scan everything in, and then you scan yeah. it out at the end, and you try not to touch it or move it away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, I guess in that role, I had some other interesting facts that kind of led into a cybersecurity background. Um, yep. So during the hospital refresh, like we'd be, you know, I was pretty new into that job and I didn't mm. have like an ID or anything. Uh, so I'd be walking around uh, the hospital and talking to the doctors and nurses and saying, hey, I'm from IT. I'm here to refresh your computer. Um, can you write down your username and password for me? Um, and I never got questioned at all. Um, so, you know, I wasn't right. in cybersecurity yet, but it was a, definitely an a interesting fact and, and learning for me. Um, and yeah. most of the time I'd find like they already had their username and password written down on a post-it note beneath the keypad that they could just pass to me. So I'd just like copy it down for them. So <laughs> yeah, in interesting. So that's, yeah. Hopefully that's changed since back then. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Did you like, I'm interested, like, did you ever come across, um, like a an attack on the hospital while you were there at all like did you ever have to deal with anything like that because there's quite a lot in the news now where you see hospitals getting ransomware which might ransomware probably wasn't as big it of a thing definitely back then, wasn't right? a big thing back then no. yeah uh, we're talking yeah almost two decades ago <laughs> okay um no back back then uh you know I, I was only there for maybe four months as well so it, oh, okay. it wasn't a huge yep. stint that i was there but yeah um no, it's definitely changed. Like I, I've, I've done a lot of work since then in, in medical industry, uh, looking mm -hmm. at things like uh, hardware penetration testing on you know, CT scanners and stuff like that. So it's, it's definitely yeah. a, a completely changing industry. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of ethics around going after that stuff. It's, it's pretty pretty rough for ransomware operators to be even considering it, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. And then what was the transition like? So I like I never knew this about you, that you used to work in a hospital, which is super interesting. So, but I do know that you kind of moved into the OT space. Was that as technical support as you went or was that as you started your cyber journey, you started moving yeah. into the OT space as, as a cyber professional back then? Yeah, um, so, I mean, I got my initial role, uh, luckily I landed a graduate position. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was after I graduated university, I, I'd applied for um, a number, actually just a handful, actually not too many uh, roles. Most of them that I was applying for, I uh, was a bit kind of out of my uh, uh, immediate vicinity. <laughs> I was a bit tired of uh, living in Perth and I started applying for some random things in you know, Melbourne and uh, around the place. So I actually ended up landing yeah. a position uh, in, in Canberra, uh, working with a, a company that was doing uh, services for the Australian Signals Directorate. Um, okay. So there, there's a, a scheme called the Common Criteria that uh, has evolved, still there, but it's, it's basically a certification scheme for products that can be used by the, the government. So it's a global scheme, mm -hmm. but it's essentially there's a uh, there's a number of labs around that are certifying products like printers, network devices mm -hmm. uh, for use in, uh, in in government environments. Uh, at least yep. kind of like low hanging fruit to make sure it's not completely uh, exposed. Um, yep. So yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much how I got my initial job. So uh, I, I moved from Perth to Canberra um, and worked in that graduate role for a number of years. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And so that was like that sounds a bit of a mix of like hardware testing and then the um, like software cyber side as well. So definitely, yeah, it was quite quite different from most people's pathways into cyber. I would say. Yeah, it was, it was definitely getting thrown. Uh, immediately quite deep into the technical side of things. Mm. Uh, so it was uh, pretty quite technical penetration testing, uh, software analysis uh, at certain levels, you'd, you'd be looking at code, but uh, depending on how, how deeply they're certifying the product um, is, is how much you got to see. Um, so yeah. Yeah, okay. I, 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 I have mean, a, a kind of an interesting background on, on actually getting that role as well. Uh, yeah. So. I found out after landing the role that I was actually um, less qualified than some of the other people that had applied for it. Um, so okay. some of the people had, had degrees and they'd already had uh, like network certifications, uh, CCNA, things like that. That probably would have been a better mm -hmm. position for that role. But um, I, kind of luckily, uh, I had actually joined the reserves during my um, university degree. <laughs> so after my first year, I, I was kind of 
contemplating what I really wanted to do, and I ended up yeah. um, joining as a uh, cavalry scout in the reserves. Um, I didn't think this really had anything to do with my career at the time, but um, what I actually found is I, after getting my uh, like certified or getting a through basic training, I ended up coming out with a, a kind of very basic security clearance. Um, mm. And that security clearance, I think, is what kind of led to assist me getting that role um, because, you know, having a, a basic clearance is easier to upgrade to a, a more advanced yeah. or more higher clearance that you needed for that position versus, yeah, uh, yeah I, I guess, um, somebody off the street. You don't know what kind of risk you, you're coming into with getting clearances. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's actually super interesting. It was like indirect that, that helped you along your path. I know. Yeah, it was unplanned, that I guess. That kind of helps, yeah. 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 yeah, I can definitely understand. Like looking now, like people who are looking for jobs in Canberra, like it's very clearance heavy, even at baseline level clearance. So yeah, but without knowing that, you kind of like locked into it a little bit, which is yeah, uh, yeah, good in that sense. Yeah, and so, even like so the the hiring guys, so the the um, hiring manager was you know, ex-military, mm. and a lot of the people there are oh, yeah. ex-military. They yeah. moved into different uh, IT positions or security roles, yeah. so. You know, having the background, um, I think definitely helped me land that position. Mm. I'm not saying everybody should go out and join the reserves. It actually burned me out quite a bit during my uh, my studies. But yeah, um, yeah, it's it definitely it's just kind of an unexpected kind of pathway for me, I guess. Yeah, nice. Um, so I'm actually going to jump a question, and then we'll come back to the next one that I had. But so you went to uni and you studied, and then got this graduate program. How closely aligned at the time did you find your university degree was with giving you those skills to then go into something like this graduate role? I I guess after graduating, I was a little bit um, mixed in my opinion. Uh, I felt like a lot of the foundational knowledge that I needed for the role that I went into, I probably didn't have. Um, mm. Some things that maybe I should have picked up when I was there, but um, I, I guess I kind of felt at the time that university was more like a checkbox to get me into the role that I needed or I wanted, right? right? Um, mm. and, and I kind of came away with the the feeling that university was more about teaching me to learn and teaching me to kind of build my own knowledge than it was about teaching me things. <laughs> yeah. Um, that said, I mean, even up until now, like I'm, I'm even recently finding that some of the software engineering practices that I learned way back in the day, I'm still using, like they're, they're coming mm. good for me now that I wouldn't have known about if I hadn't gone down that pathway. So mm. yeah, I think, you know, later into my career, I'm getting more value out of my university degree than I had at the start. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. And was it a software engineering degree that you did at uni? It was computer science, but we did okay. uh, quite a few yeah. classes in yeah, software engineering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice. And then I guess what was the transition, and transition can be quite broad here from um, like that initial hospital job in your study at uni to now, but things like uh, self-study as you've gone through other courses, and then obviously mentors that you've had along the pathway, like... Yep. Um, maybe I, I think, you just expand on what you think's really helped you throughout your career. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually I actually have something right at the end that I, I made notes for, but I, I probably chuck that in here. But uh, yeah, so I, I guess like having people to learn from is uh, it's probably the most valuable thing, and, and having experience mm. in, in positions. I I don't really hold certifications too highly these days you know a lot of it's uh, yeah. book learning and um uh you know a lot of the the highly paid certifications are you know multiple choice that you know you can kind of cram something and remember it and then two weeks later you've yeah. forgotten everything um but you know having experience and having side projects uh that you've yeah. kind of worked on to demonstrate what you can do um mm. i think is, is really valuable um yeah in, in my career i kind of broke my um I kind of planned it out like and broke it into phases that uh, I still think is, is kind of valuable from my perspective. But, you know, I, I kind of broke it into like four phases. So, you know, initially getting through the door, getting a job, um, getting in there. And, you know, once you realize you're in your initial role, there's there's so much you don't know. Um, you, mm. you really don't know what you don't know until you're in that position. Um, once you're going to get in there and start building that out, you can start understanding where you'd like to be and the different kind of pathways and careers you can go down. Um, from there, you kind of actually figure out like that there's there's a lot of knowledge you need, and you know once you're in IT, there's there's a lot of specializations you can go down. Um, mm -hmm. IT as in itself is a huge huge industry. Um, cybersecurity is a huge industry. There's specializations mm -hmm. you can go crazy crazy deep on, 
And you know, from there, I, I kind of chose the um, specialization of industrial control systems, which in itself is actually quite a large industry. Um, yeah. And you know, I've gone down further pathways of uh, you know, penetration testing, incident response. Now I'm in detection engineering, which is um, mm. probably one of the most specialized areas you can get into um, right down deep. But I also find yeah. that the, you know, the more specialized you can get, the, the more valuable, valuable you are in that position. It, it's very, yeah. very hard to find people that can like replace me. <laughs> so if mm. you, if you can get yourself down into that position in your career, um, you know, you become valuable and you start, uh, having a lot of opportunities, um, open up for mm. you. Um, I guess after doing that kind of knowledge and specialization identification, uh, you know, for me, it was like gain knowledge, spend the time, invest the, uh, my pathway in, in gaining as much knowledge as I could. Um, I actually turned down some quite attractive, uh, financially attractive jobs to work in, um, different areas that I knew I would learn from the people. Um, one of the specific, uh, jobs I'm thinking about is, uh, I worked for a company called IO Active, um, the best out of Seattle. And some of the guys that uh, were working there at the time, I was using their material on YouTube and you know, blogs and stuff to try and replicate some of the techniques that they were using in, um, in my work. And uh, mm. the job opened up to, to try and get in with them. And I was like, I'm going to learn so much from these guys. So I turned down a highly paid contracting position for a nuclear power plant and went yeah. and worked with them for a lesser salary. But I knew that the, the knowledge that I gained from working directly with these guys that have been um, like reading all their materials from would be yeah. you know, far more valuable for me. Yeah. And it's also the, um, like sometimes just the excitement of like picking what you really want to, and, and being in that position, but the excitement of what you can learn from people and, and what you really want to do. So that's like, that's exactly. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested. You were talking about like how you broke it down into phases. Like I haven't had a guest, uh, ever talk about that before. Like really like career planning, um, where you want to be or just have like a general framework like where did you pick that up from and then maybe you could just elaborate a bit on like for people listening how someone in uni now might go about just like framing that for themselves as they're moving forward i don't think this is something i, I picked up anywhere it's just something that i've kind of built my my focus around um okay so you know i mean getting in the door getting a job and and understanding where you're at what you need to do um, and mm -hmm. then moving through to like, you know, specialization, getting the knowledge, you know, investing your time and your effort in, you know, working with smart people and, and, and getting as specialized as you can. Um, mm -hmm. I, I valued that, like the knowledge much more highly at that time than taking a job that, you know, may not be as beneficial to me from a knowledge perspective, but may pay better. Um, so yeah. once you've kind of built those specializations, that's when I was like, all right, now it's time to capitalize, you know, start, you know, mm -hmm. firstly probably financially capitalizing on the work that you've put in. Um, yeah. You know, once you've got to a point where you're happy with where you are financially, um, then you can start looking at things like job satisfaction and, you know, or potentially doing your own thing. Um, so yeah. capitalizing from a, you know, a happiness perspective. That's, that's the sort of yeah. the way I was, yeah, I was yeah. planning myself out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I've, I've definitely heard that across, like, because I listen to like a lot of personal development and, and business stuff as well. And that's quite... Um, it's a topic of conversation that's in the sphere a lot at the moment about there's this grind for education and it's discomfort in the initial stages and the work-life balance potentially comes later because it's what you're saying. It's like you need to get all this knowledge and specialize in whatever you're doing and then you get the finance from it because you are in a position to be specialized and sell your yourself and this set of skills you have and then you get to a point where you're like, okay, now I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do because I'm so specialized and it's more of a negotiation with whoever you're working for if you're doing your own thing kind of kind of stuff as you're well. You're definitely holding more cards at that stage. <laughs> yeah, it's just interesting. Like I've never seen it in talked about in this space, in cyber, I guess, but it, it it's existing out there, but it's interesting that um, like there's so many similarities to how you've approached it and it was purely because you valued that education up front. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't know. I, I probably read something a long time ago that, that led me mm. into this thinking, but uh, yeah, I couldn't bring it to, to the front of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, so I think I talked about the study and then I've talked about that one. So like, it seems like you've been quite broad across your career in terms of what you've done. So you've done instant response, pen testing, 
you're now doing detection engineering, which is quite niche and specialized as well. Um, like, what other areas have you, like, have you ever done GRC before and done yes. that documentation? <laughs> yeah, done above. that as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there anything, like, because this is quite a broad question, I guess, because you've had quite an interesting career. Is there anything you haven't done that you'd think you'd want to go and do that's kind of within the IT or cyberspace? Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I, I do consider myself to be like a jack of all trades that has specialized mm. um, down at Pathway. Um, I, I think you know some of the roles that I, and the jobs that I had in the past, especially with consulting, um, you get thrown into lots of different areas. So GRC, mm. audit, um, risk assessment, pen testing, you, you get a lot of different things thrown at you. Um, you know, th there's still things that I, I think back at and, and go, you know, GRC may be boring, but it's profitable, right? And I've got some yeah. great, great startup ideas that I could do in the in the GRC space that I'd love to, if I had the time and the interest to prioritize those. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, from a, is there something I'd, I'd like to have done? Um, I've kind of had a taste in everything, to be honest with you. I, I've been yeah. pretty happy with um with my career so far, and yeah, um, and where I've kind of ran, um, wound up, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's really cool. And so what's, what do you think's been, and you don't have to pick one here, but what's been a highlight for your career so far? Yeah. You know, probably working with you, Desi, mate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I'll, I'll put that in the advertisement. Yeah, definitely. The, That's a the show. Yeah, keynote. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I like, I've got a few, um, as I mentioned, I've done a few things now. I had an opportunity to work in quite a lot of different places around the world, um, from, uh, the United States. I was based in California for uh, quite a few years. Um, I've worked in Saudi Arabia, I've some Middle East around there and, and different places in Europe I've, I've worked. So it's been, um, it's nice to see the world and, and to get paid while you're doing it has been really, mm. really cool. Um, from, in terms of actually like work that I've done, um, um, I had this kind of thing floating in the back of my head when, when I was coming into this, but, uh, I remember one engagement where I was called unprofessional by a US, uh, vendor. Uh, for finding a way to get back into their network during a penetration test on a smart metering uh, device. Um, <laughs> at the time when, when we were doing that, we were actually based on a contract in China. Um, so <laughs> it was basically using the product that they were selling into China that we managed to basically open up and get a way back into the vendor's network, uh, which was meant to be quite a highly secure network. Um, right. And, you know, at the time, you, you think they would have been grateful and kind of thankful for us in like plugging that hole for them, but you know, they went the defensive route and said we were unprofessional, which we all had a pretty good laugh about at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jeez. Yeah. It's interesting. interesting. It's interesting. Uh, like a, it's been my experience in instant response cases as well. It's interesting when people take it personally almost, and it feels like yeah. that's why rather than being like, Oh cool. You found this hole. It's like, yeah. now I'm going to look like shit. Yeah. It's just, yeah. you know, especially if, I don't know. There's a lot of things with uh, responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities and um, mm. things like that. But you know, this is, this is a paid engagement. We weren't disclosing anything. Um, yeah. A lot of vendors get extremely defensive if you have identified a vulnerability in their product. You're notifying them of it, and then it gets announced and, and released, and they have to deal with the, the media and the blowback mm. and all that kind of stuff. That's that's problematic, and you can kind of see it from that perspective. But mm. it's just interesting to see how people will. Um, take things and it's also just something you need to take in your stride like at the mm. end of the day laugh about it you know somebody's going to call you unprofessional for finding things that they've screwed up and letting yeah. them know about it before they get compromised um you know, it's, yeah it's what it is right <laughs> yeah i think it is in i'm not sure the release order of these episodes but one of the interviews that i recently did like we talked about um i guess the ethics of cyber and and doing instant response or pen testing. Um, and then also those soft interpersonal skills where it's kind of like that little bit of, you need that little bit of hardened skin sometimes. And yeah. there's going to be conflict in your job at some point, particularly if you're doing contracting or consulting because um, people aren't going to like what you're telling them. And so it's dealing yeah. with that kind of that stuff as well, which is not, not taught. You definitely, I think, learn that quite a lot on the job. Um, and have, <clears throat> having good like mentors and other people in your team around you to help get through that kind of stuff. Definitely. Yeah, I've actually been in some 
pretty interesting meetings throughout my career um, mm. you know, from working with uh, with customers. So from from a perspective of sitting in a room with a customer who's been trying to get a vendor to patch or fix a product that they've got in their environment um, yeah. that they haven't been prioritizing for a long time and having their legal team absolutely grilling them in front of you um, through to you know working under privilege um, from from legal teams yeah. and, and not being able to discuss certain things with organizations it's it's just it's, it's very interesting and, and like you said the, the soft and interpersonal skills that you gain um, and and how you approach situations it's it's challenging mm. it's uh, it's nothing I can I can teach it's not it's not something that's uh, easy to put down in a, in a training plan or a workshop it's, yeah. yeah I do I like I probably take it for granted, but I do find when I meet people at conferences, there's definitely like this, this feeling of you can tell when people have worked in those hard environments before and like instant response or like dealt with really difficult people because everything else just like doesn't seem to phase them and it's just like they'll roll <laughs> with it. And it's, yeah, it's that understanding of like, oh, okay, you've seen some shit and like dealt with the, like some very stressful situations. I, I find it similar across when you talk to people in other like fire response or that kind of thing. It's just like, this isn't the worst thing that could be happening right now kind of stuff. Yeah, and I yeah. guess you find uh, a lot of people are rather skeptical as well. If you've, if you've got the experience, like you're hearing, yeah. you, know, you, know, uh, you know, rushes in my plant or something like that, you know, you're gonna go, yeah, okay, let's let's calm down a little bit. Let's, let's walk <laughs> yeah. through this and, and just explain it to yeah. me. Like, don't go crazy. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you don't yeah. need to, turn everything off and cause a failure somewhere or right? yeah exactly. like, let's get through it first yeah 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 i, I guess so, the other the other thing that was um probably pretty big in my career was just the role that i had in um the investigation of that incident in saudi arabia uh mm -hmm. so uh yeah it, it was basically a, an incident in a petrochemical facility that basically in the end of the day led to the uh, u.s government putting bounties on several members of the russian fsb um, the federal security service uh, yeah. And a sanction on a research institute based uh, institution based out of uh, Moscow. So that was that was pretty cool. Super Had a interesting, uh, yeah. fun day when when all that got announced. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would have been interesting. Yeah. So um, we'll switch gears a little bit. What kind of passion projects do you have at the moment, and this cyber or otherwise? Yeah, um, probably too many. <laughs> it's more, more, <laughs> I think, uh, more projects. I think than we I all time. do. Yeah. yeah, I've got this long list of stuff that I know is never going to get done. Yeah, focus and prioritization is my problem at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of pet projects related to uh, open source intelligence and network traffic analysis that I'm, I'm kind of tinkering with on the side. Not, nothing I can really go too deep into, but yeah, um, yeah, it's it's been interesting. You know, it's um, you know whether it's kind of setting up like a a side project that's not conflicting with your current job or kind of like, mm. like building plans for something you can do after after your current role yeah. or something to the future it's, it's kind of cool um one, one of the things like i have learned um doing these kind of side projects is is kind of not getting bogged down into learning phases i find that you know at mm. least for myself and i know a lot of other people get bogged down into trying to understand every little piece that you need like going through workshops yeah. and um, you know, online training and tutorials on how to develop certain things, how to do database integrations and, and so things like that. But um, realistically, if you've got a good idea, um, sometimes it's just worth diving into it um, before you've even learned everything because you yeah. learn much more actually jumping into these things. And yeah, you know, it's, it's also quite cheap these days to get a developer uh, on like sites like Freelancer that can support you in building out certain things, um, mm -hmm. at least getting like an MVP off the ground that you can either quickly burn down if it fails or you know progress um if it, if mm. it becomes successful so yeah yeah i don't know if that kind of that <laughs> it's a, well it's actually interesting i before i jumped on this call with you i was actually i was doing um a session with my pt and we were talking about this exact topic about creating courses and not getting too bogged down in like the structure and the learning phase and just get something to market and then iterate on that like yeah. if it if it fails drop it try something else but get something out if it works a little bit change it so it works a little bit better exactly and like, it's like fail yeah. fast right if, if it's gonna yeah. fail let it fail quickly so you don't get too invested in it yeah yeah and then um just like that mentality of like always innovate on what you've got and just slowly make it better over time so yeah, yeah. super super interesting yeah um yeah beyond that um basically just 
house tasks at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Try and spend yeah. as much time with my kids and uh, yeah, build some stuff for them where I can. Yeah, yeah. I definitely can understand that pain of um, focus and prioritization, though. It's uh, it's a never-ending list of things that I want to do, and then it's just like, well, what do I actually have time to do? Yeah, what, what's going to pay off the best? Yeah, where yeah. where should you be yeah. focusing, and is it is it going to pay out, or should you be shelving it or getting somebody else to help you out with it? Yeah, yeah. So, where, is that part of the goal for the next six to twelve months that you have? Is I guess house stuff, your side projects that you're working on, and and some I think, other things. I think prioritization of my focus is probably my goal for the next six to twelve months. <laughs> so to be honest, with you, it, it all feeds together. Yeah. But um, you know, I have a lot of they call it the honeydews, you know, honey do this, honey do that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Kind of getting stuff done around the house uh, that, yeah. you know, my time is probably not best spent on. Um, so figuring mm. out what is worth just getting some people to, you know, paying the painter rather than spending the, the week doing it. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, that week for yeah. me, with my time is, is probably better either spent with my kids or, you know, spent on a project that could pay out in the future. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's challenging. It's also, so it's funny you mentioned painting. So when, because, we moved into this house in April last year and my partner really wanted to paint the garage. And I've now learned that I never want to paint a wall ever again <laughs> yeah. because for one, like we, you don't have all the tools to do it correctly. And then two, like my body isn't used to it. Like I, like I like to stay fit and train, but just painting on a roof, my back killed me for like a week. Yeah. I was like, man, like I, I would rather pay someone to paint the rest of the house exactly. than ever to have to the feel that pain. Don't yet. Use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's it's just like I don't know. You're doing something new for the first time, and I'm like, how often am I going to paint a house? Like, if I was flipping houses as like a side thing, and you were doing it all the time, I'd be like, okay, I'll do it because you save money. But exactly, yeah. But even then, one, if you're flipping one, houses, like, do you get a painter to come in and do it for you, and then you focus on more houses, right? Or do you... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What? What? <laughs> scale uh, up yeah, eventually. Always like, what's the best use of your time and money? And yeah. like, yeah, hundred percent. Interesting. Um, so a little bit of a random question, but what did you want to be when you were little? What was five-year-old Julian like yeah. aching to be? Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, I actually always wanted to be a pilot. So I remember even okay. after high school or in high school, I did like a career placement kind of thing that I think I was at like the Singapore Flying College, the so Singapore Airlines mm-hmm. um, in Perth. So they had a, a college where they, they train at Janicott Airport and flight simulators and stuff like that, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but I, I always wanted to either kind of be a pilot and I, I actually came very close to dropping out of uni. Um, and going down the path of being like a, a, a helicopter pilot in the army. Which is kind yeah. of how I actually got into the the reserves at the time. It was a yeah, right. kind of a negotiation of like, do I drop out or finish the degree and then maybe pursue it? But yeah. Um, so yeah, I very happy with the career path that I've taken after graduating and yeah. you know, getting specialized as I am. But you know, I kind of poured one out for my my future dream when I was like when I turned 27. It's like the cutoff. You cut off to kind right. of join as a as a pilot in the army. You yeah. just can't do it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what, like, what do you think shifted you from that, that focused of wanting to be a pilot and even like the Singaporean being like a commercial pilot kind of thing, what shifted you to yeah, staying think, with what you're doing now? I think, yeah, times have changed as well. And uh, being a pilot probably isn't as glamorous as it used to be. And yeah. you know, even job security is not where it was. Um, True. And yeah, I, I guess also, yeah, you know, once you, once you've got a degree, you kind of want to capitalize on it. And yeah. you know, if you've got a degree but no experience, there's that kind of period afterwards that may make it harder to get a job. And I kind of felt mm. like after getting my degree, I kind of wanted to capitalize and move into a job so I didn't um, lose the value of it. Uh, mm. And then it kind of, my time burned away and it never happened. <laughs> uh, but I even then, led, like... You led know, to the next and yeah, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, as a, like a private pilot, I'll, I'll probably one day get a license and just do it for a bit of fun with you. Approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Um, and so it sounds like you're super busy with your career, and and the projects are still quite cyber focused. And then the house, obviously. What is it that you do to unwind, or is kind of your side projects? Do you feel that helps you unwind a little bit as well? It does to an extent, but there's also stress involved in that. Um, and yeah. and like I said, you know, get somebody to help you, but there's also stress in getting someone to help you. If you've got a developer yeah. working for you, you want to capitalize on the time that they're spending. 
Um, mm. So there is time in planning and stuff like that. Um, I honestly don't have a good example of something that helps me unwind at the moment. I'd say <laughs> I like spending time with my kids as much as possible, but yeah. I can't also say that that's unwinding. <laughs> um, a lot of the time that can be stressful and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, the, the older they're getting, you know, the more I realize that the time I have with them is, uh, is extremely important. It's more valuable. Mm. You don't get that time back. So, um, I would like to have more things to unwind, but I don't have the time to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Goes back to that, uh, prioritization, I guess, and focus. Yeah. Pay the painter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pay the painter so you can get that time back and do something yep. else. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so the last thing that I have for you is what, recommendations do you currently have for people that are outside the industry considering a change and now i like to focus this on more people who are considering a career change rather than graduates because i think they're they're going down a pathway there's kind of opportunities there um but maybe someone who's like maybe doing it or like i've even seen people completely flip from like teachers or, or like two of the mentees that i had were one was a teacher and one was uh, um, in marketing and as they've both transitioned into cyber. But what kind of recommendations would you have for someone yeah. like that? Yeah, I, I don't know how you're going to edit the earlier part of this, but we've kind of touched on a few things. But, you know, I, the IT yeah. industry is massive. Um, it's There's a lot of ways into it. Uh, you know, if you're specifically looking at cyber, there's, there's ways to get into it from um, non-technical through to technical ways. Um, mm. And... Yeah, it's just a huge amount of opportunities like a GRC role. A lot of it's um, uh, very kind of non-technical reading, understanding and, and logical pathways. Um, mm. You know, one of the most kind of interesting things, there's a lot of different backgrounds that end up in IT and in, in cyber. A lot of people don't have a traditional pathway uh, of getting into uh, you know, yeah. a degree or studying and, and going through that. Um, one of the most professional consultants I worked with when I was in my uh, earlier uh, phases of my career um, had actually a, a degree in entomology. Um, so that's, that's the study oh, wow. of insects. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he was brilliant. Uh, he super professional, very technical. Um, I learned yeah. a lot from him and how to portray myself as a consultant and, and how to address yeah. uh, certain things. So, you know, who would have thought that somebody that studied insects would have a, such a successful career in cybersecurity, right? It's, it's crazy. So yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say that your background is a limitation. Um, you know, yeah. so there's a lot of materials and a lot of things available for you to learn, but you know the, the number of ways that you can get into a, a, a position in the industry is is huge. Um, mm. And I also like you know I went I went down that kind of uh, discussion of the, the phases of my career. Like you're not always mm. going to walk into the job that you want. It's it's not going to be it's sort of like buying yeah. a house, right? You're not going to go buy your dream house the first house you get. You, you kind of mm. get like an apartment, and you work your way up with a bit of equity, you know, a bit of knowledge that you've gained. Um, mm. and kind of work your way through. Uh, and, and, you know, having that initial job in, in IT or in security or uh, wherever you land uh, is not where you necessarily are going to be. It, it's like a foot mm. in the door that allows you to gain the knowledge. Um, a lot of the time, once you're in an organization, there will be positions that open up. Um, you can network your way through to the places that you want to talk to uh, and then just kind of find out what you need to know to get that position. So definitely lots of ways to get in there, lots of ways to um, uh, approach where you want to be. Um, and yeah. then, yeah, like I said, just factor in knowledge. Like if you can focus what you want to do and, and how you approach things on what you're going to learn and is that knowledge going to benefit for you in your career and, and addressing mm. where you actually want to be, uh, then focus on getting that, get that knowledge. Don't worry so much about if you, if you have to take a pay cut or if you're not going to mm. take that, that high paying job, if you can, learn what you need to learn to get where you want to be in, in you know, a couple of years. That's definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, I like the analogy of building up equity and getting a house. I haven't heard that one before. Um, with your, your point about networking, that's quite a common point that I get with talking with a lot of my guests. So I'm interested to know for you, and this is like a left of field question that wasn't on our list, but what does effective networking mean and look like to you? I'm, uh, <laughs> it's funny I say it, but I am actually terrible at networking. So if you throw me into yeah. a, um, like a you know, social networking environment, like a, a meetup or whatever, I'm, I'm pretty terrible at it. I, yeah. I'm bad at maintaining uh, contacts and things like that. But I, I do find that it's extremely valuable that once you're in an organization to establish uh, relationships within the organization because you know, 
positions open up, uh, you may be able to do things like getting a um, uh, second, secondment into a different environment that you, you may mm. learn that knowledge. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a challenging thing. Like, you know, a lot of people in the IT industry and security especially uh, are not extroverts, right? We don't we don't yeah. thrive in going out and meeting new people and, and establishing these kind of relationships. So mm. it's uh, it is challenging. But you know, if if you if you start getting into a technical or a very kind of specialized area, you'll find that um, you'll start to notice other people that are in your area that um, have such a specialized knowledge that you have as well that might be worth reaching out to them. Um, and mm. a lot of the cases you'll find that um, these people are very open to talking uh, because you're in a weird place just as they are and um, they're happy to share and learn from you as much as like you learning from yeah. them. So yeah. it, it is quite good. But yeah, I am definitely not the model of networking. I, I could, could have done much better in my past. <laughs> When people say networking, they often think of those like cocktail mixes. You're in a big room of 50 people and everyone's handing around business cards. And it's not, that's not the only form of networking. It's the, like you chase that knowledge and you have this knowledge and you want to learn more. So you reach out with someone who is your, your peer in learning that knowledge. They might just know a little bit more. And then you're creating that connection there, whether that's in your own company or, or external, um, yeah, definitely. like I, I, I remember when we first met, I think it was I was looking at getting a job at Dragos and I reached out to you for a chat just to be because we were like you'd done that similar role before. And I was like, what do you think about it? Like, what what was your yeah. experience like doing that role? Like, what were the goods and the bads? And like, that's kind of how we established our our connection right before I even started working at Dragos. So even yeah, no, I, I think, networking, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think you'll find that if you're demonstrating interest in an area that somebody is focused in. Um, yeah. A lot of people are open to talking and, and having a chat. You know, it's, I, I never, I never turn down anybody that messages me. Hopefully, my LinkedIn's not going to get flooded now. But <laughs> um, you know, if somebody hits me up and asks for a, like some advice, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll be happy, to, happy to respond. Like, like with yourself and some yeah. of the other people that are working at Dragos now. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, yeah, share what you know, help others. Yeah. Good yeah. approach. And then definitely like once, like I remember once we're in, like we still maintain that, like we'd catch up every two weeks, I think, and talk yeah. about problems that we're facing or like just interesting things that were coming up because you'd worked in a different area by then. But yeah, like yeah, and it that, goes, that goes past that as well, right? You, yeah. You've moved on and we're still keeping in contact. So it's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's good to have these kind of relationships. Yeah. 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 And still like interesting fields and I guess the industry itself is small and you run into people down the track as well. So. Yeah. You do need to be careful with your relate. Uh, so your reputation in, uh, in, in security, because um, if you do something that it goes against kind of ethics, um, it is a small industry and, and people will hear about it. So that's, yeah. that's another good tip to, to share. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would definitely say to the, the people listening to this is like, there's been plenty of, like I'm, not currently in a recruiting role or like hiring manager role or anything, but I still have friends from other roles who are at other companies reach out and go, Oh, do you know, do you know this person? What do you think? And so that rep, and sometimes I know them, sometimes I don't, sometimes it's like a passing. I know the person, maybe sometimes I've worked with them and it's been like, I know exactly what they're like to work with. So yeah, your reputation is, is definitely important. And to maintain that, you just need to work ethically and like be a, be a good worker and just um, always try your best. Like and yeah. realize that you can make mistakes and recover. But yeah, yeah. I think also just treating others as you want to be treated is yeah. a good approach to life in general. Yeah, <laughs> very, very, very true, mate. Thanks so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. And why I love these series is I always learn something new about even my friends like the whole hospital job and um, just everything else that we've talked about as well. So it's interesting when you really dig into people's career and life, how much more comes out. Um, so really glad you came on and, and got to share with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Well, nearly all of my content is free, uh, but if you want to support, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, which this will be on, um, or grab the podcast from anywhere that you like grabbing your podcast from. Um, and you can check out my website, hardlyadequate.com, uh, where you can support the show as well. But thanks all for listening, and I'll catch you next time.